Hello everyone. We infectious diseases specialists love to nag about other doctors not doing something right, how they either use the wrong antibiotics or they always forget to take blood cultures. And while most doctors, including GPs, hospitalists, surgeons, have to deal with all sorts of infections on a daily basis, most of them don't have the time to study infectious diseases 24-7. So in this video, I'm going to share 10 tips that are guaranteed to help physicians improve patient care and reduce the number of snarky comments from infectious diseases specialists. So number one, azithromycin is not the first choice in the treatment of bacterial sinusitis and otitis media. I always proudly state how azithromycin was discovered right here in Croatia, and ever since it got introduced, it has remained one of the most popular antibiotics around. And what's not to like about this drug? It's highly effective against most respiratory pathogens, it penetrates very well into the respiratory mucosa and the lungs, it's very convenient because you take it once a day, it's safe, it's basically perfect. And as you can imagine, it was exactly this popularity that ultimately led to problems. Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most important, the most common and the most dangerous cause of bacterial sinusitis and otitis media and community acquired pneumonia for that matter, has built up quite a level of resistance to macrolides to azithromycin over the years. So now in Croatia, about 30% of pneumococci are highly resistant to azithromycin. It's similar in the United States and many countries in Europe. I've personally seen adult patients with otitis media who were treated with azithromycin only to develop life-threatening complications like pneumococcal meningitis or subdural empyema. The countries that still have a low level of resistance of pneumococcus to macrolides are the countries where these drugs are used sparingly as a second or third option in the treatment of otitis media and sinusitis. Bottom line, please check your local guidelines. And I do mean local, because depending on where you live, you cannot just blindly rely on American or British guidelines, because as you can see, resistance rates vary widely between different countries and even between different regions within the same country. As a general rule, beta-lactams, so penicillins like amoxicillin, for example, are more reliable against pneumococcus than macrolides. This is because complete resistance to penicillin is still relatively uncommon, but partial resistance is on the rise. The way you circumvent this partial resistance is by increasing the dose of amoxicillin. So in most guidelines, you will see that amoxicillin with or without clavulanic acid is first-line treatment for bacterial sinusitis or otitis media. Now, depending on the level of this partial resistance in a given area, in a given country, you might find that either normal dose of amoxicillin is recommended or high dose amoxicillin. Now, for people who are allergic to penicillin, can you at least use azithromycin as an alternative, as a second line treatment? Well, again, this depends on the local resistance rates. If they are too high, you will have to use other classes of drugs. Tip number two, ciprofloxacin is no longer reliable as empiric treatment for UTIs. Much like azithromycin, the popularity of ciprofloxacin will ultimately render it useless. I still see that many doctors, entire hospitals even, just love this drug for whatever reason and they use it to treat everything. What is even worse, they often use very low doses, which is just perfect for promoting antimicrobial resistance. Now, what is good about ciprofloxacin is that it penetrates very well into the kidneys, into the urinary tract in general, especially into the prostate. It's one of the few drugs that achieve high concentrations in prostatic tissue. It used to have very good gram-negative coverage, but of course, over the years with this widespread use, E. coli and other gram-negative rods have built a significant level of resistance to this drug. So in many countries in Europe and the US, not to mention Asia, these resistance rates exceed 15, 20 or 30%. So of course, for patients with severe UTIs like acute pyelonephritis or urosepsis, it's quite risky to use ciprofloxacin as monotherapy, right? Now, if you already have a urine culture and the pathogen turns out to be susceptible to ciprofloxacin, it's still a great choice in the treatment of prostatitis. Again, it's one of the few drugs that achieve high concentration in the prostate. So for directed therapy, it's okay, but for empiric treatment, there are always better options out there. Tip number three, 
Amoxicillin clavulanate has excellent anaerobic coverage. I often see doctors prescribe amoxicillin clavulanate with clindamycin or with metronidazole and this is completely unnecessary because beta-lactam, beta-lactam is inhibitor combinations like amoxicillin clavulanate, ampicillin sulbactam, piperacillin tazobactam have excellent anaerobic coverage. On top of that, doctors tend to overestimate the need to cover the anaerobes. Think of it this way. If you really think that you need to cover the anaerobes, chances are that you need to consult a surgeon as well. Because anaerobes live in the necrotic tissue, abscesses in the gut. So again, the patient might have a problem that will not go away with antibiotics alone. Okay, so far does this all sound familiar or are you learning something new? Either way, I'm sure that you can appreciate how important it is to know this stuff. So think, who else might benefit from these tips? Your colleagues, your students? Simply send them the link to this video. I'm sure that it will help them a great deal in practice. Moving on, tip number four. This is a big one. Please do not treat asymptomatic bacteriuria. Studies have shown that many elderly people have bacteriuria often even with pyuria. So they have bacteria and leukocytes in their urine. This is especially common in nursing home residents, people with severe functional disability, people who are immobile, in people who have chronic urinary catheters. Pretty much 100% of them will have bacteriuria with or without pyuria after two weeks. And these people don't have the symptoms of a UTI. So they don't have fever, they don't have the surya, frequency, anything. If they did have these symptoms, this wouldn't be asymptomatic bacteria anymore. This would be a UTI. Now, of course, sometimes it's not easy to tell the difference between the two. When you have an elderly patient with fever and you don't know the cause and you find bacteria and pyuria, it's difficult to know whether this is the real cause of their fever or simply an incidental finding of bacteriuria that's been there for who knows how long. I realize this is difficult, but the fact remains that asymptomatic bacteriuria should not be treated except in a very few well-defined indications. So in pregnancy, in people who are going to have surgery that will involve the urinary tract and in some renal transplant recipients. Because if we start unnecessary treatment, we will simply wipe out the bacteria that colonize the patient's bladder, which will create room for more virulent and potentially more resistant bacteria to move in and cause a real UTI. And yes, chances are that these bacteria will be highly resistant because they were recently exposed to an antibiotic. Which means that now we will have to use broader spectrum antibiotic which will expose our patients to potential side effects, drug interactions, not to mention Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. A terrible, very difficult to treat condition that is potentially lethal and the patients who are at high risk for Clostridium difficile diarrhea are the ones who are at risk of asymptomatic bacteriuria in the first place. So the elderly, people who are immobile, nursing home residents, people with urinary catheters. So please remember that not every bacteriuria is a UTI. Not every bacteriuria requires treatment. Speaking of Clostridium difficile, tip number five. Please remember that in every elderly patient with diarrhea, you have to suspect Clostridium difficile. This is especially relevant if they are institutionalized. So again, if they are nursing home residents, if they were hospitalized recently, by recently I mean in the last couple of months. The same goes for exposure to antibiotics. If they've been exposed to antibiotics sometime in the last couple of months, this still increases the risk of Clostridium difficile diarrhea. So this increased risk lasts a very long time after the patient has already finished their course of antibiotics. For hospitalized patients as well, regardless of their age, if a patient in a hospital develops diarrhea all of a sudden, after several days of hospitalization, it's highly unlikely that they have Salmonella or Campylobacter. It's possible, of course, but please don't forget to test for Clostridium difficile. Not to mention that in elderly patients, non-infectious causes of diarrhea have to be considered like overuse of laxatives or drug interactions or paradoxical diarrhea. And of course, they can have salmonella or norovirus just like anyone else. Bottom line, in elderly patients, the differential diagnosis of diarrhea is much broader than in an otherwise healthy adult. Moving on. 
fever and delirium. It's a central nervous system infection until proven otherwise. Anyone who works in the emergency department knows that delirium is not uncommon in elderly patients with, let's say, pneumonia or a bad UTI. But the question here is, what exactly does elderly mean and how certain are we that this really is just pneumonia or a UTI? Because any kind of smudge on chest x-ray gets labeled as pneumonia and we've seen how easy it is to attribute fever and any kind of symptom for that matter to a non-existent UTI. Now, institutionalized patients with pre-existing dementia and severe functional disability and now fever and delirium pose a difficult diagnostic challenge. How do you determine whether or not they have a central nervous system infection? Do we perform lumbar puncture every single time? No one really knows. Let's not forget that many of these patients are on anticoagulants. Many of them will be in septic shock by the time they reach the hospital. So even if you wanted to do an LP, you cannot do it right away. There are no guidelines that would help us here. So basically we need to decide on case by case basis and this uncertainty is just an integral part of our job. But what is certain is that if your patient doesn't have history of dementia or functional disability, regardless of their age, I don't care how old they are, if they present with fever and delirium, this is a central nervous system infection until proven otherwise. Please don't destroy your patient's life and your career. You have to exclude a central nervous system infection, which will usually mean that you have to do a spinal tap, of course, if there are no contraindications. I talk more about this in my free online course on recognizing serious infections early. It focuses on sepsis and central nervous system infections. If you work in acute care, I highly recommend that you take this course. It will help you a great deal in practice. Speaking of sepsis, if you have a patient with a skin infection and fever, you have to suspect staphylococcal sepsis. Now, in my video on skin infections, I explained the difference between erysipelas and cellulitis. Now, I realize that many doctors, even authors of textbooks, don't see this as something particularly important, but in practice, it can make quite a difference because erysipelas is usually caused by streptococci, most commonly by group A streptococcus, the same bug that causes strep throat. And just like in strep throat, fever can appear several hours before the local signs of infection appear. And it can be quite impressive with rigors and chills, but ultimately the prognosis will be very good. These patients might need to be hospitalized for a short while, but serious life-threatening complications are very uncommon. On the other hand, in cellulitis, an infection that involves deeper layers of the skin and is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus, bacteremia with subsequent metastatic infections can happen. So if you have a patient with cellulitis, even if it doesn't seem very impressive, but your patient has fever, and especially if they have rigors and chills, you have to take blood cultures. And if you isolate the pathogen, especially if it's Staphylococcus aureus, you have to plan for more extensive workup, which will include cardiac ultrasounds to exclude endocarditis, and you will look for metastatic infections depending on your patient's symptoms. Sepsis and bacteremia lead me to the tip number eight. When admitting a febrile patient, please always take blood cultures. And in adults, make sure that this is at least two sets. And this is why. In a crowded ER, it's easy to make a mistake. So let's suppose that you admit a patient for what you assume is a bad UTI. You start treatment, but then after a couple of days, you end up isolating an unusual pathogen from the blood culture, something that doesn't fit the diagnosis of a UTI. Of course, this will make you re-evaluate your diagnosis, but not only that. You will know what kind of antibiotic would work best for this infection because you will have susceptibility test results, right? And when I say that you should take at least two sets, again, there are two reasons for that. Number one, if you take more blood, you are more likely to catch the pathogen in your patient's bloodstream if it is there in the first place, of course. And number two, there are pathogens like bacteria that grow on human skin that can either be contaminants or true pathogen. If you only take one set of blood cultures, you don't know how to interpret that. But if the same pathogen grows out of several different blood cultures, 
then of course it's more likely that this pathogen really is causing your patient's illness. But just like with sepsis and CNS infections, I talk about this in detail in my online course on recognizing severe infections early. So again, I highly recommend that you take a look. Tip number nine, young men almost never get urinary tract infections. I already did a video on this. Urinary tract infections are common in men over 50 or 60 and the incidence only increases with age. But in young sexually active men, urinary tract infections are very uncommon. So when a young man presents with painful urination, you should suspect things like urethritis, so potentially an STI, and only then a urinary tract infection. And if your young patient really does have a confirmed UTI, you should look for a predisposing factor like an anatomical abnormality, history of surgery, a tumor, a kidney stone, something like that. And especially if this happens more than once. So again, urinary tract infections are very, very uncommon in young, otherwise healthy men. And the final tip, if your patient doesn't have plausible exposure to ticks, if they don't have characteristic symptoms of Lyme disease, please do not test them for Lyme disease. With so many unnecessary tests performed every year, it's unavoidable that you will end up with a lot of patients with false positives, even with two-tier testing and everything. On top of that, we know from serologic studies that in highly endemic areas, there are many people with positive antibodies who don't have any symptoms of any disease, right? So, a positive test without the context of symptoms and plausible exposure does not mean anything. Not to mention that the antibodies can persist for months or even years after infection. So, this is what happens. People with all sorts of symptoms, all sorts of conditions, all sorts of diseases who don't have the diagnosis, they don't know what is causing their problems, they go through all sorts of doctors, they go through dozens of different tests until finally someone decides to test them for Lyme disease, usually out of pure desperation. And the test comes back positive. And when the test comes back positive, they're overjoyed because they feel that they finally have the answer. They finally know what's been causing their symptoms all along. It was Lyme disease. And more often than not, it doesn't have anything to do with Lyme disease. It's a false positive. And maybe it's a true positive. Maybe they did get infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, who knows how many years ago, but it doesn't have anything to do with the symptoms that they're experiencing. So now it's very difficult to persuade this person that they should keep looking for the right diagnosis. Of course, this exposes them to unnecessary treatment of Lyme disease and all the potential side effects of antibiotics. So please, if you don't have very convincing characteristic symptoms of Lyme disease, do not order serology for your patients. And there you go. I hope that you memorized all of this. If you are more like me and you like to have notes, as always, I prepared a PDF file with the summary of this presentation. You can find the link in the description of this video. I hope that you will share these tips with your colleagues and students and that you will use them in practice. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.